Okay, so we're going back here trying to describe this um, parallel, not only between Moshe and Rabbi Akiva, if you recall, how Rabbi uh, Moshe Bena was the written Torah and Rabbi Akiva was the oral Torah, but it's going to get us into this concept over here of the foreknowledge of Hashem and the Bechira and the fact that we ourselves still have free will. So, how does that work? So he, he explains in a very deep way. I, I'm sure that I'm not going to do justice to the words of Rabbi, of, of Rabbi Tatz over here, but we'll just try to understand on a, at least a superficial level what he's saying. And remember, we're learning that Hashem gave the written word and he left it up, somewhat he left it up to us to be the ones that are going to bring about the, the authenticity of the oral law, meaning even though that the oral law was given together with the written word at Mount Sinai, he left it up to the toiling of man in this world to be able to squeeze out the halacha, to squeeze out the laws, the nuances, and everything like that. So how, how and then he asks, how can humans create Torah? Doesn't make any sense. There's something very paradoxical about human intellect constructing a Torah that Hashem agrees with. Remember, God is infinite, and he's perfect, and he's all-knowing, and he's almighty. So how could I, who is not infinite, who is imperfect, who is very one-dimensional and, very, and quite small in, in the bigger scheme of things, how could I construct a Torah Shabbat Peh, an oral Torah, that God himself is going to agree with? That turns out to be a, fathom, a fathoming of his original Torah in such a way that all the sages create, all that the sages create is sourced in the written Torah. And then it's even deeper than that, he says. That uh, one of the Chazal, the sages, they're not going to say anything that isn't really found inside the written word itself. Meaning they're, not, meaning they're saying things that you don't find in the written word, and yet they're not saying anything that's not in the written word. How could it be that you can have such a situation, says Rabbi Tatz, that they're toiling away in the study of Torah to try to understand deeper and deeper and deeper. And they say things that if you look at the black and white words of the written Torah, you're not going to find what they're saying. And yet, at the end of the day, if Hashem is the one that is, is agreeing to what they're saying, then it must mean that this is what HaKadosh Baruch meant in His Torah. Hashem is not giving us a license to make up laws. He's not giving us a license to create nuances and misses that don't exist. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu is allowing for, for us to be able to reveal to the world what those mitzvahs are all about, that must mean that within the, within the reality of the written word, all of that was really already there. And the truth of the matter is, is that when you learn Gemara and you begin to look where they pull out the drushes, where they pull out the exegesis from, where they were able to pull out the, the where they, they darshan, where they... Um, how would you say in English? Darshan? Where they expound upon words, or they expound upon letters, or they expound upon sentences and verses that are there, you'll see that everything that the sages are saying is really being pulled out of the Torah. It was already there. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to work to uncover it and to unearth it. For example, there's diamonds in the world. They're not lying on the streets. You find them only in mines. And you have to get the machinery and you have to get the tools and you have to spend days and nights plowing through and digging through and breaking through the, the coal and the, and the rock to be able to get to the diamonds that are there. The diamonds are already always there. It's just that in order to get something that is valuable and precious, you've got to put in the effort to get there. So the Reb Tats is saying a similar idea over here, that the, the words of the Torah Shabbat Peh, of the oral law that comes attached to the written word, it was always there. But the only way that we're going to get there is with the toiling and the effort and the chiseling and the cracking and the getting the tools and using the, the tools of, of, uh, of, uh, of expounding upon the words of the Torah that we're allowed to use to be able to get there. Yes, yes. So they had it. They had it. So, that, so, but the, so the way that he's describing it is, is that when it was given, 
it was given over in a way that if you want to really understand what the oral Torah says, you're going to have to toil away to be able to squeeze out what is inside of there. It's not, it's not, it's not like a Sefer Torah. It's not like a Chumash, where everything is written there in black and white for you to see. Because as we pointed out last time, if you just go by what it says in the black and white, you won't understand how to do any mitzvahs. Any of them, almost. There's, there's no details of anything. Let's just take, for an example, it says that on, on Sukkot, you're, you're supposed to take the Dalami and the four species. It doesn't explain clearly exactly what the four species are. It doesn't say exactly what kind of, what kind of fruit or what kind of tree or the like and how you're supposed to hold them and put them together. So without the oral Torah, you wouldn't know what, you wouldn't know what to do. To a sukkah? You wouldn't know how to build a sukkah. It doesn't say anywhere in the Torah how to build a sukkah. You don't know. So, but, so what he's saying is, is that the, it was there, it was already there, but we are the ones that have to squeeze it out to be able to understand. Now, let's go a little bit further what he says. Rabbi, this question is that Hashem gave his approval to that which is our final version of Mishnah and Gomorrah? Yes, of course. Yes, that's what he's saying. Hashem's giving his stamp of approval. That you have you have uncovered the you have uncovered the oral word, which already was within enveloped within the written word. No, in certain cases when we don't have an answer. The only, only in certain cases. Now, so, so Reb Tatz goes on further. And he says. Um, and even when the creative effort occasionally appears to override aspects of the revealed Torah, it transpires that Hashem agrees, and that's beyond human comprehension. Meaning, I can't understand my, the fact that there could be something in the, in the oral Torah that would seem sometimes in, in, our, in our mind's eye, possibly even argue on that which it says in the Chumash, that's something that is beyond human comprehension. Because there's God's mind and there's my mind, and my mind cannot, will never fully be able to understand God's intention and His wisdom and what He had in mind. Now, what does that sound like? What does that sound like to you that we got to a place in the Torah where things are going to take place that are very hard for a human being to understand how exactly it works, but it's beyond human comprehension? That sounds like everything that we've been saying up until this point about foreknowledge and free will. That Hashem knows everything, and yet man has free will. I, how could it be that Hashem knows everything and you still have free will? So we've been saying all this time from the Rambam, because there's a place somewhere in the brains of a human being where you can't go any further, which means you can simply not understand and comprehend what Hashem is saying and what Hashem is doing. And he says, this is the echo of the paradox of divine knowledge and human free will. The written law is a record of God's knowledge. Chumash, the Sefer Torah, it's the record of God's knowledge. The oral law records the opinion of human sages, seemingly the opinion of human sages, and despite being an expression of human effort, it turns out to accord with the divine record that was written before the world was created. Meaning the sages are never going to go against the Word of God. They're always going to reveal what the Word of God was. They're going to reveal what was already known to Hashem. Maybe not to us, but it was already known to Hashem. Despite the divine authority of the written Torah, Hashem holds back the authority in the face of the oral Torah. And this is exactly the parallel to God's withholding of His knowledge in the face of human free will. Just like Hashem holds back all of his authority in the oral Torah because he wants us to be involved in the process of learning. He wants us to be in the process of making the Torah eternal. So therefore he like conceals himself in order to allow us to do our work down here in this world, toiling away to be able to bring about the revelation that's really there the whole time. The same thing we said, Hashem decides everything. He knows everything. He's even, we could say, planning everything yet he suspends himself to an extent or conceals himself to allow each and every one of us to have our free will in our lives. One who is immersed in the Talmud 
and experiences the meshing of absolute wisdom with human wisdom that forms the seamless composite of creator and created that is Torah that is Torah is experienced something of the mystery of divine foreknowledge and human free will. That's what he's saying over here. It, it's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a part of the miracle that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does that he entrusted us with the skills and the tools to be able to learn his oral word and arrive at the proper conclusions which themselves are just an expression of that which is already in the written Torah. Just, it's concealed away, tucked away. Many times that you see in the Gemara, there'll be a drasha, there'll be some kind of expounding upon words that because I have a word over here, and I have a word someplace else in the Torah, but it's the same word, so whatever the halach is over there, it's going to be the same halach over here. So what does that tell you? That tells you that it was already there inside the Torah, it's just Chazal, the sages, just bringing that out into, our, into the reality. That means that Hashem held Himself back to allow us to have, be part of the process. Says Rav Tass, the same thing is going on in the world of foreknowledge and free will. Hashem knows everything, but He's holding Himself back in order to allow us to be part of the process of our lives as well. Written Torah and oral Torah meet in a reflection of the paradox at the secret heart of creation. I don't know exactly what that means, but in English he seems to be saying that this idea, the Torah itself, as we know that HaKadosh Baruch Yistakel Baraisa Hashem looked inside the Torah and he created the world. That means the whole world is really an expression of the Torah because all the creation is, is spoken about inside of there. And so the oral Torah, which is part of that creation, it's really those two worlds converging and, and colliding with each other and being enmeshed with each other is a reflection of the paradox of the secret heart of creation, which means apparently it's, it's, it, it's hard to understand how that works. Ta- written and oral enmeshing together, so too is it very difficult to understand foreknowledge and free will. How are those things enmeshed together as one and yet, just like it's beyond human comprehension to really understand how HaKadosh Baruch Hu could allow man to be involved in the process of giving over the Torah, and yet he does because he wants our involvement, so too it's beyond our abilities to fully understand how Hashem knows everything, yet he wants us to be involved in our lives in the world of free will, and therefore he gives that over into our hands that even though that he knows everything already, he has pulled himself back, concealed himself to allow us to have in our everyday active life, in the real time that we are in, the abilities to use our free will in everything that we do. Okay. I, yes. would be of what to expect from non-Jews. What do you mean? What is God's expectation from non-Jews? Less. I think what, would <coughs> what? As a Jew, how would you recognize what God would want for them? So the truth of the matter so the, the truth of the matter is, is that the non-Jews are supposed to live by the the Noah the Noadic, I don't know how you say it in English. Uh, uh, laws, which Noah, who was the non-Jew, was given seven laws that he had to keep, and the non-Jewish world really is supposed to follow those laws, and if they will do that, that will make them into a good person, the way they're supposed to be. I wouldn't think any of the non-Jews would even, most of them would never. Right. So it. there, there are bigger, growing numbers of the non-Jewish world that is learning about this system and these laws, and they are embracing them as the true way for a non-Jew to have his relationship with Hashem in the world. And if they embrace that, wouldn't, they, wouldn't then the next step would be to become Jewish? So that they don't have to. They don't have to. If, they, if, they, they they decide, if they decide that, you know what, seven is just not enough, I'd rather have 613, no. because I see that it's a higher level of existence, and that's what I want for myself, then certainly they could. But we wouldn't, we, don't, we wouldn't encourage it. 
We wouldn't, we wouldn't force them. If they want to, they certainly could. There are, as I said, there are communities now called B'nai Noach, the children of Noah, that are, or the descendants of Noah, that they are, they are living this. And there's even Orthodox rabbis that are going and teaching them to, inf- to explain to them and teach them their laws that they're obligated to keep. That wouldn't necessarily be uh, the Christian community. No, the Christians are following, uh, are following a false god. So what, well, what other people would there be if we don't have a god out there? Unless it's atheists, but they wouldn't go to the rabbis about learning about the Noah's uh, right. rules. Right, so, I mean, so I mean, where would you get these people? No, no, no I mean, if you could convince uh, non-Jewish, let's say Christians, that you know, your belief is faulty, because you don't really believe in one God. And we believe the whole man, all of mankind is supposed to believe in one God. Now there was a man named Noah, and he taught the world how to do that. And he was given commands by God, and that's what we know for the non-Jewish world. They're supposed to abide by this. So you have Christians that are, that are leaving their Christian faith because they realize that there's something that's the, not, not adding up over there in the system of Christianity, and so they're, they're embracing the one God religion of being a descendant of Noah. If Christians believe in the Ten Commandments, wouldn't the first two commandments prove that they're wrong? Yeah, that's, part of the, that's one of the great questions that is asked upon them. And you'll have to ask them what their answer is. For many people who, who start having questions about Christianity, these are the things that bother them. And they can never really get a satisfactory answer from Father or the priest or, or, or Sister Mary, and therefore they begin leaving the fold of Christianity and looking for something else. Some of them do convert to become Jews, and some of them find the, the you know, becoming a descendant of Noah is, is very satisfactory for them. Okay. Thank you. Go. I think.